Welcome, everyone. Very pleased to have uh, you with us here today for This is CDR, um, online event series presented by Open Air to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, uh, and to contextualize them for a policy proposal we're working on for New York and other states and jurisdictions called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act. Um, everyone, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're Zooming in from. I'm Toby Bryce, uh, based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on CDR policy with policy advocacy with Open Air. Uh, just some quick background on Open Air. We are a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon dioxide removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Our growing global community collaborates on shared open source missions in the areas of research and development and policy advocacy. Um, there are links in the chat to, uh, to join us. Um, there's a sign up form on the website and there's a lot of information about what we do and also some information on the website about this uh, event series. So you can see past presenters and who's coming up. Quick note, uh, since we're talking about carbon dioxide removal, it's really important to define what that is. Um, it's an activity or activities that remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or as we're gonna discuss today, ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. It is not avoided emissions. It is not emissions reductions. It is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Also, when we talk about CDR, it's really important first and foremost to say that CDR is in no way any sort of substitute for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. Um, that said, every credible climate forecast, including most recently and in very stark terms, um, the uh, this year's uh, IPCC um, annual report, say that uh, CDR will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century to meet our climate goals, to get anywhere near two degrees um, Celsius. And we are, Robert Hoagland, who is a, a really great uh, analyst out there in Sweden, um, he recently estimated that we're at about 50,000 tons of uh, CDR. So we have a couple of orders of magnitude we need to cross to get to gigaton scale. A lot of work to do, um, and that's why we're here today to learn more about CDR and talk about uh, great companies, great um, uh, organizations like Project Festa who are working on CDR. Mega, um, let me pass it over to you to introduce Project Festa and today's speakers. Hi everyone, I'm Mega Raghavan, uh, based in London, and I also work on Open Air's CDR policy advocacy team uh, with a particular interest in the legislative policy opportunities for California. This week, we're very happy to welcome Kelly Earhart and Tom Green from Project Festa to tell us about coastal carbon capture as a CDR solution and provide an update as to where Project Festa are in terms of research, development, and deployment of carbon negative sand. Um, as usual, our format will be a 15 to 20 minute presentation, followed by a few prepared questions and then moderated audience Q&A. So please type any questions you have into Zoom's Q&A box. Um, note that it's separate from the chat box, so just find the one that says Q&A. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send that video link out to everyone who registered, and we'll also post it to Open Air's website and to our YouTube channel. We'll also be live tweeting today's event. Um, we'll put our Twitter link in the chat, and please follow along with that. Um, if you do tweet, the event hashtag is hashtag this is CDR. Um, and now for the main event. Kelly Earhart is the co-founder and director of development for Project Vesta. Kelly has a multidisciplinary multi background and is committed to reframing complex issues into scalable and holistic solutions. She has commercialized sustainable technologies, provided strategic direction to multi-stakeholder initiatives, managed disaster relief projects, produced large-scale international events, and consulted for climate change mitigation projects. Tom Green is the executive director of Project Vesta. Tom began his career as a biologist, then spent 20 years in various corporate roles at Capital One, Lending Club, Bain and & Company, and Averon, spanning marketing, data analysis, communications, product strategy, project leadership, and general management. He is the co-founder of UK climate change nonprofit, We Are Ancestors, and he has advised the Nature Conservancy on strategy. He holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, Kelly and Tom, over to you. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, we're really excited to be here today uh, and so so grateful to be a part of this uh, this community of uh, people that are doing the work that is so necessary in, in the world. Um, I'm Kelly. As uh, Mega said, this is Tom. We're also really happy to actually be in person today. We're in the middle of an executive offsite retreat um, where we're, we're deep in the throes of working on progressing our, our solution. Um, so it's really lovely to be able to call in together. Um, and with that, I'll kick us off and uh, start sharing screen. 
So at Project Festo, we're working on what's called coastal carbon capture, which is a dual approach to both carbon removal and coastal resilience. And so we don't need to spend much time on this. Uh, this. This reality is not foreign to any of you. And I'm sure uh, we're calling in from California where we've seen forest fires ravage our, our homes, our friends' homes. Um, and many of us are seeing the, the coastlines that we love change um, as we experience sea level rise. And you know we're all talking about this as a climate crisis or a climate emergency. And uh, it's very clear, I think, to, to me, Tom, and I'm sure to all of you that it is. And so today we want to we wanna explore um, our solution as, as one solution that I can help. So this is CDR. You know, it's clear that we need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and that emissions reductions uh, aren't going to do it. And an analogy that we really love to, to speak to is that you know, if you imagine a bathtub and you wake up in the morning, you turn the tap on and you go make a coffee to, to try and fill the tub half full while, while you're out. You come back and uh, you're ready to turn off the tap, but the tub is now overflowing. There's water everywhere. And so you turn the tap off promptly, of course, but you don't expect the tap being off to result in the bathtub emptying. That's kind of the same as, as we see happening in the atmosphere today. Carbon dioxide is flowing into our atmosphere twice as fast as it's being absorbed by plants and natural sinks like the ocean. So unless we want extreme weather events to keep getting worse, we need to take the excess away. And as Toby mentioned, you know, CDR must be combined with emissions reductions, but today reductions won't do it alone, just like turning off the tap isn't going to empty the tub. And so at Project Vesta, uh, we're really inspired by the ocean. And uh, it's important to acknowledge the role of the oceans in storing um, excess carbon dioxide. So since the Industrial Revolution, the oceans have actually become about 30% more acidic, which to put into context is actually like dumping 16 Olympic swimming pool size pools of battery acid into the ocean every minute. And so, uh, what we need to do is mitigate ocean acidity and help the oceans do what they do naturally, uh, store carbon dioxide as bicarbonate. So at Project Vesta, we asked the question, how can we reduce ocean acidity? And what we found is that we can take a volcanic mineral called olivine. And it turns out the solution uh, is simply bringing that sand, bringing that olivine to the beach, bringing sand to the beach. So we call this solution coastal carbon capture. Um, we're massively, we're working to accelerate the long-term carbon cycle, a part of the long-term carbon cycle by using the power of the ocean to speed that long-term carbon cycle up to a relevant human time scale. We're rigorously monitoring ecological safety at every step of the way and really centering community engagement and local ownership as we grow. Um, so step one is we take olivine, which is a natural, abundant volcanic mineral. We grind it up into sand and call that carbon removing sand. We take that sand and put it in coastal areas where it dissolves with the help of wave energy, tides, and marine ecosystems. And then the, uh, the, uh, the rock helps to increase alkalinity and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. As I mentioned, this process can also help create resilience for coastal uh, vulnerable coastal communities that are currently on the front lines of climate change, experiencing sea level rise and erosion, which we're excited to talk a lot more about later on. Uh, but to bring us back, you know, this process is overall helping make the ocean more alkaline, um, which converts carbon dioxide into a safe bicarbonate in the ocean. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Uh, so what, what we're doing here is we're, we're accelerating the Earth's natural long-term mechanism for geologic storage of carbon from the atmosphere. So the way this natural process works, which has been happening on Earth for billions of years, is that when rain falls on volcanic rocks, those rocks actually dissolve a little bit and the carbon dioxide ends up in the water, it ends up flowing down to the sea, and marine calcifying organisms like corals and shellfish use it in their shells. And, and when those organisms die, the shells and skeletons actually form ocean sediment on the seafloor 
and eventually that's subducted into the Earth's crust as, as limestone. And then eventually that will actually come back out of a volcano and the cycle continues. So this is, this is the Earth's natural way of keeping the atmosphere in balance over the long term, which is great, but it's a very slow process. And so what we're doing here is we're speeding that up. And we speed it up by taking these olivine rocks, grinding them into sand and putting them directly in the ocean. And the increased surface area of the sand and the fact that it's in motion and the grains are colliding with one another speeds up the process of the olivine dissolving in the water, which removes carbon dioxide on, on human relevant timescales. Now, this isn't just about carbon dioxide removal, and this is one of the most exciting aspects of the solution of coastal carbon capture. It is also about coastal resilience. So um, almost 5 million people in the US with it, live within four feet of current sea levels. And, and any of you who live near the coast have seen the fact that sea level rise is happening, it's accelerating, we're seeing stronger and stronger storms and the surges associated with those storms can lead to significant flooding. And of course, we've seen that uh, numerous events over the last few years, including Hurricane Sandy. Um, right now, there are 60 million tons of sand deployed every single year just in the US alone to protect coastlines against these storms and against sea level rise. So this is a very significant activity that's already happening. And there are a lot of towns that need these projects that are currently waiting for them because they're not funded yet. So what we can do here is we can include olivine sand as part of these coastal protection projects. Now, wh why would we wanna do that? Well, of course you get all the benefits of doing coastal protection, protecting coastal assets, but then you also get to mitigate ocean acidification at the same time. And as you probably know, ocean acidification is causing uh, many marine ecosystems to come to the brink of collapse. We're seeing Dungeness crabs literally dissolving. We're seeing uh, fishery yields decreasing um, and so on. And when you, when you think about what's going on with this coastal nourishment industry, <clears throat> we're essentially moving sand around to protect, to protect against the effects of climate change but there's a lot of diesel being used in, in those projects. So we're actually contributing to the problem at the same time as adapting to it. If we include olivine sand in these coastal protection projects, then we can turn a carbon emitting coastal protection project into a carbon removing project. And that is just such a, such a win-win. Um, at the same time, we can also find, help to finance these projects through the sale of carbon credits that are, that are created when we include olivine sand in these projects. So we can actually make these projects cheaper as well as making them carbon removing. Now, this is one of, one of, the, one of the important things about CDR and Toby gave some context at the beginning around just the, the enormous scale of CDR that is needed relative to what exists today. And you know, we really need to get into the billion ton, billions of tons uh, of CDR on a global level uh, as really as soon as we can. And one of the great things about coastal carbon capture is that it's a highly scalable solution. There's a very large amount of olivine. It's, it's, it's one of the most abundant minerals on the planet. Uh, so there's plenty of olivine available. Uh, also, the oceans are large and there are therefore uh, significant deployment areas that can, be, that can be used for coastal carbon capture. We need less than a quarter of a percent of the area of shelf seas around the world to remove a gigaton, one billion tons of carbon dioxide. And then in terms of the infrastructure we need to do this, we need to dig up a lot of rock, grind it down and move it around the world. And those are the kind of supply chains that have already been built. And so one example uh, is, is the coal industry, which of course is part of, part of the problem here. The coal industry uh, moves uh, over 4 billion tons around each year. And that's good news actually reducing over time. And so that's bringing online capacity that we can use for this. So the opportunity here, and we're, we're still at you know, the relatively early stages here, just, just getting started. Um, and we're doing these demonstration pilots in different places around, uh, around the world. And these are, really the, uh, these are really the prelude to eventually beginning to actually scale up and make a difference on a planetary scale. 
So we're here to harness the power of the oceans to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and help leave a planet in which we can all thrive and help coastal communities to take charge of their own resilience through coastal carbon capture. And, and uh, we'd, love to, uh, we'd love to engage with you on this and we're happy to take your questions. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. That was really, that was really great. Um, we do have a couple of prepared questions and then we have a, a number of audience questions coming in and audience, please keep your questions coming. We'd love to get to them. Um, just to start, I mean, the first time I read about Project Vesta was maybe a year ago in Bass Company or something like that. And it's such a novel, like fascinating idea. Can you tell us a little bit about both of you, how you, where you were in your careers when you first heard about Project Vesta and like kind of how you got animated about climate and this particular solution um, and your initial reaction, how you ended up joining the organization? Sure, I can start. Um, so I actually co-founded Project Vesta back in 2019. And that was after spending uh, my career working on different carbon removal solutions and commercializing different sustainable technologies. Um, I had worked uh, initially on commercializing a direct air capture technology and then on scaling regenerative agriculture. And um, in more of an independent consultation phase, I came across enhanced weathering as this solution that held so much promise and uh, you know, was cited in the IPCC report and was cited in any of the sort of projections that we saw that mapped how we got to 1.5 degrees. And um, no one had yet uh, deployed a solution or set forth with a company through enhanced weathering uh, that seemed to be on a path to scale. And so we kind of put our heads together and, and thought, let's see if we can bring this incredible lab-based research that's been uh, you know, demonstrated for the last 30 years or so in lab settings out of the laboratory and into real world testing and viability demonstrations to see if coastal enhanced weathering and what we now call coastal carbon capture is a viable solution to, to scaled carbon removal. Um, and as Tom spoke to the, the scalability on so many um, aspects as well of some of these co-benefits that then turn into cascading benefits when it relates to ocean acidification and the potentials for coastal resilience. That's really uh, why I've committed to, to coastal carbon capture. Yeah, I mean, for me, I um, you know, studied biology, you know, over, over 20 years ago and even at the time, uh, it was well known in, in the scientific community that the climate change was already becoming a crisis and that we needed to have already been doing something about it. And through my, through my career and uh, various different enterprises and a bunch of time in tech, I, I spent a lot of time feeling sort of despair and guilt, just despair about the climate and guilt that I wasn't doing anything meaningful about it other than personal action. And, um, and so then I decided to take a step back and look around for, uh, for a place where I could make a difference. And I talked to Kelly and the other co-founders on the team. And what, what really impressed me about, about coastal carbon capture, uh, other, than, other than the scalability, is sort of this, it's such an intuitive solution. I mean, nature is already doing this. You know, the oceans are already removing CO2. And um, we, we just need to give them a helping hand. And if we, if we do that, then uh, you know we can really make a really make an impact on a planetary scale, you know. And and you know I think I think you know it, here here in Silicon Valley we tend to be very attracted to sort of fancy technology and you know sort of technical solutions. Um, but but the reality is um, those those solutions are very hard to scale to to a planetary level. Um, but you know. There's a lot of olivine and there's a lot of ocean. And when you put the olivine in the ocean, you're basically doing something that is accelerating nature in a way that is sort of a set it and forget it solution. You know, you put the olivine in and it will do its thing, you know, and it will keep doing that. Uh, and so, you know, to me that just, it really, it really spoke to me on an intuitive level at the beginning. And then of course I started to dig into the science and realize that it is, a, is actually, you know, it does have that potential. Yeah, that's great. Um, for the, the, the CDR policy proposal that open air, um, are working on we're it's this the carbon dioxide removal leadership act um we're really focused on trying to center equity and environmental justice in the policy um you had a great slide that talked about some of the coastal resilience benefits that that your solution can deliver to coastal communities can you talk a little bit more about like how you are factoring that into your planning and strategy 
Um, you did talk a little bit about the benefits, but also in terms of harm avoidance, which I know you're being very diligent about with your studies in the Caribbean. Um, just uh, maybe just a few words on that. Yeah. So environmental justice is is definitely very cent, uh, central to us, and uh, we're we're really keen to include coastal communities and have them be front and center at the decision making table uh, when we're looking to deploy in a, in a new coastal community or an island nation. Uh, we our first deployment site in the field um, is likely going to be in the Caribbean, so we've just completed our initial baseline sampling there and are uh, are doing additional additional work before we actually actually deploy olivine and we're, we're still uh, in the permitting process for the, the deployment of olivine. But prior to that, we've engaged a social sciences work stream uh, where we're involving the local community there in a um, sort of a, a process by which we can include them in, in the decision-making process for, for how and when we deploy olivine. And we're actually co-authoring what's called the ethical code of conduct for coastal carbon capture with the Aspen Institute and a few others to try and set a framework for what proper action is on our coastlines when we're thinking about bringing in these kinds of interventions and ensure that we're getting out ahead of that and centering the voices that you know so many of these communities didn't contribute to climate change for the most part and are feeling the effects first and worst. And so making sure that their voices are heard in this process is incredibly important to us. And kind of as Tom spoke to with the coastal carbon capture meets coastal resilience angle, with that, you know, we're we're excited about the potential there to be treating both the root cause and the symptoms of climate change with coastal communities, um, introducing them to this solution that you know obviously treats the root cause by removing carbon, but also can help support the the stability and preservation of their of their important coastlines. Um, we're also exploring a number of ways that we can work with local communities as we grow, um, you know, to to do different revenue sharing. Um, revenue sharing uh, opportunities with them to try and give back to local communities where we where we engage. That's excellent. Thank you. And I'm um, really great that you are focusing on that so much. Um, I'm going to throw in a question that, that I kind, of, kind of occurred to me as you guys were speaking just about the um, the carbon removal credit markets. I think we can all agree that the offset markets historically have been kind of a mess um, and hopefully they will be getting better in the future. And you, um, Project Vesta was one of the inaugural Stripe um, CDR purchases, which was fantastic um, to see. Question number one, how do you see, you know, hopefully the markets will be moving toward permanent removals if we're offsetting a ton of carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, how do you see the, the, the buy side evolving? Do you think that most of your future is going to be with direct deals like with Stripe or whether it's a government or another corporate buyer? Or do you feel like um, marketplaces like Patch and then there are three to five new ones that are evolving that are setting up programmatic um, carbon dioxide removal purchases um, do you see yourself participating in those? And how do you see that balancing, you know, over the next decade, let's call it? Do you want me to take that? Sure. Sure. Um, so I think we'll participate in, in both and or all. <laughs> so currently, um, we are actually, we've been in conversation with many different carbon removal marketplaces. And um, I've been talking with them about ways that we can work together once we're ready to provide carbon uh, removal credits. So right now we we still haven't generated our credit. We still haven't put olivine down on the, on 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 a beach. So uh, we don't necessarily have credits to sell, and we pre-sold some of our credits to to Stripe. But we are looking forward to the future and making partnerships with corporations and marketplaces today, so that you know our supply can 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 go to those who are interested in buying it um, in the future. And so we're thinking really creatively about what that looks like. Um, and that definitely looks like working with marketplaces. It definitely looks like working with corporations. Um, and in terms of the, the, the demand side of things, I'd say that there is a lot of demand in, in the marketplace right now uh, for more permanent, durable solutions. Uh, what I've heard time and time again from corporations is that they would love to be buying uh, carbon removal that isn't just forestry and isn't just soil based and that they're interested in permanence but there's just not uh, there's just not enough supply. Right. And I think we have a lot of work to do as a CDR community to be able to bring um, validated, verified supply to these to these customers and be able to meet that demand. 
Um, and I also think that there's a lot of work to do on the policy side of things, um, as you mentioned, in differentiating between permanent, uh, permanent solutions and temporary removal solutions. I think that, uh, I believe it's Carbon Plan, their website has a fantastic permanence calculator that if you haven't checked that out, definitely go and play around with that. You can toggle for how long a solution um, is in operation, how long it takes that carbon credit to be generated, and then how long it stays, uh, that carbon stays out of the atmosphere. And you can um, you can sort of play with different prices there where you might see that you know a project is selling a carbon credit for $20, but realistically to keep that permanently out of the atmosphere, it would cost Cost 180, something like that. And so I think that really globally and uh, and nationally for, for countries that have, you know, like the EU ETS, I think we need to differentiate between the value of these solutions if we want the carbon market to stand up. Um, and I think that there's ways that that can support all players in the industry, incentivize furtherance of, of certain land use practices by, you know, securing credits for people in the future if we are supporting a permanence threshold um, and also hopefully bring some price parity for, for the permanent solutions that have a little bit of a, a higher cost. Um, so we've definitely seen that in the marketplace and at Project Vesta we're excited to explore many different sort of carbon credit sales solutions with partners, with corporations, with marketplaces. That's great. That's a very great and expansive answer to my question. Thank you. Um, and one follow up on the you mentioned verification. So some CDR pathways like direct, direct air capture that are taking carbon dioxide out of the air are gonna have a very discrete and easy, easily measurable output in terms of removal. Pretty much every other pathway, and I would put you in that bucket, there's gonna to have to be a little bit of a leap, a leap of faith on the buy side. Um, you know, Maybe you're gonna be able to demonstrate a theoretical um, removal that your process is going to generate, but you're not going to be able to monitor it across every instance of your process, at least I would think. How do you see that happening and how can we, you know, how can a, pro how can a pathway like Project Vesta get to a point of, you know, MRV measurement reporting verification where when can we decide, okay, this is, this is going to be the removal that we can expect from whatever a ton of olivine that we spread on the beach over XYZ period of time? Like, how do you guys think about that? And how can we get them by side, you know, beyond folks like pioneers like Stripe and Shopify who are taking this leap of faith, how can we operationalize this? Yeah, so uh, of course, MRV is very important um, here. And, and as, you, as, as you noted, it's not quite as simple with us as here's, here's the block of carbon that we just produced. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting when, um, you know, what, when you talk to a marine geochemist about this, um, and by the way, but uh, just to, for the sort of the stat on this is that one ton of olivine removes about one ton of CO2 from the atmosphere. It just so happens that's the way the math works out. Um, when you talk to a marine geochemist about this, uh, as a scientist, they will essentially tell you, well, I mean, if you put the olivine in the ocean, it is going to dissolve. That there is nothing else that could possibly happen from it. Like it's it's just physics, you know. Um, and you know we don't think that's enough, right? We, um, but that, in some ways that's kind of a um, a comforting baseline for anyone who really digs into the science. Um, that you know when you put olive in the ocean, it is going to dissolve and remove CO two. We think that uh, we will, of course, need to uh, we will, of course, need to demonstrate it, especially to lay people, um, uh, you know, at a, a at a more detailed level than that. And so um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be doing some demonstrations that actually show that when you put olivine in water, that it reduces the carbon dioxide concentration in the water and in the overlying air above that. And then, as we do deployments, we're going to be uh, we're going to be monitoring those. Uh, sensing the uh, sensing the alkalinity changes in the water, and when you sense an alkalinity change in the water, you're you're looking at the carbonate system uh, in aqueous solution, and so you can actually see the additional carbon in the water through those measurements. Uh, and so, so we'll be looking. Kind of do a, 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 you can have a sampling process or a monitoring process on your deployments that will validate or at least provide validation data for what you're seeing in a closed system in a lab. Basically. Exactly right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and we're taking a phased approach, like many solutions are towards MRV. Uh, you know, it's not it's not tomorrow that we'll be applying to Vera or the gold standard with our right. wrapped up MRV methodology. Uh, we have a ways to go before there, uh, but I think like many solutions, that's the eventual goal. And along the way, we'll we'll use third party validation um, uh, before then. 
Great. Um, so speaking of deployment, um, I did, you know, like following your Twitter, I'm not sure exactly where I saw them, but I happened to see over the past few several months, I saw you guys came up because there was a town meeting in Duck, North Carolina, which is on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where I used to go to the beach when I was a kid. And they were talking about dredging and coastal adding sand and, and Brian Lee on your team and, and your lead scientist Grace were testifying at a town council meeting on a small coast, a small town on the coast of North Carolina. Um, and then the other one I saw, which is a little more corporate, but a partnership that you have with the Great Lakes uh, Dredge and Dot Corp. Um, can you talk about those and like how these initial discussions and like partnerships um, would lead to deployment and like what the deployments would look like and like when with an optimistic, realistic viewpoint, these things might start to happen? Yeah, for sure. So um, we are engaged with um, a couple of different coastal communities on the uh, on the eastern seaboard at the moment, and one of them, as you mentioned, is in in Dark North Carolina. Uh, it's it's a very interesting area. So first of all, you've been there; it's beautiful. <laughs> um, uh, it's um, it is so the uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has their uh, field research facility, the FRF, uh, right there, and so it's an extremely well characterized and monitored area of coastline, and that's great for us because you know we're at the stage where we are diving as deeply as possible into uh, scientifically into all of the data that uh, can emerge from, uh, from deployments that we do. It's also an area where there's a lot of coastal nourishment projects that happen. Uh, and so the town of Duck is planning a coastal nourishment project uh, for next year. Um, and they have, you know, they, they do them every few years. And so we have been uh, engaged with the town there to suggest that it would be, uh, would be good demonstration pilot to actually include olivine sand in their next coastal nourishment project. And um, as, as you might expect, given how compelling this is, they are very interested in that. And so we are discussing that with them. Basically the idea is to, um, to as a pilot, include uh, some olivine sand in a coastal nourishment project, which could be as soon as next year. Um, and you know, monitor everything and uh, use that as uh, use that to build the data set to uh, eventually start doing doing the same thing at larger scales. And then we also are engaged in a similar process uh, in um, uh, in the Hamptons uh, in Long Island. And so similarly, there's a existing coastal nourishment project that's planned for next year, and we have uh, applied for a permit to include olivine sand in in that project. That's awesome. Um, I was going to ask about the Long Island, and if that was something you guys can talk about, um, uh, which is very exciting um, for, for New York State. Um, in terms of, uh, so we've talked a little bit with you guys in the past about open air and how we're an advocacy community. Is there a way that, that advocacy can help Project VESTA in terms of like getting permits and deploying? And if so, how might advocacy communities be an asset to what you're doing? How can we help? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, one one of the one of the things about about coastal carbon capture is that it's it's new, and like anything that is new, uh, there is no there is no existing uh, regulatory framework specifically designed to uh, support and regulate coastal carbon capture, uh, and so we are fitting in with all of the existing regulatory frameworks that exist, um, especially around coastal nourishment. Um, and so, you know, what, what we would love to see uh, happen eventually is, is specific, uh, specific policies, um, legislation and regulation uh, around coastal carbon capture. So we have a, a framework that is designed for it. Uh, and so uh, I think there's a great opportunity for grassroots advocacy for um, for awareness uh, around coastal carbon capture, um, for uh, advocating for uh, policies which support it, and you know those policies can encompass things like well, how do we do this safely, uh, and also recognizing the uh, recognizing the benefits of doing so as well. So uh, policies which uh, you know, like in the state of New York, the um, the uh, requirement that, that now exists to reduce net emissions and to include CDR 
as a part of that. You know, things like making sure that the CDR uh, that happens as a part of that is in fact permanent CDR, because what we don't want to do is temporary CDR because that just kicks the can down the road. So, um, you know, I think on a, on a tangible level, I think people can uh, advocate for for coastal carbon capture as part of existing coastal nourishment projects and really bring that up at town meetings, bring that up with, um, you know, with elected local representatives and uh, frankly, call your congressperson and say, hey, have you heard about coastal carbon capture? This is something that could really be beneficial, you know, for both the state and the planet. That's great. And as on the policy side, I mean, obviously there's all sorts of policy at basically every level of government from international to city councils that can provide incentive, incentives for carbon dioxide removal. So there's lots of work to be done there. On the regulatory side, is are most of the uh, obstacles or issues that you might face local? Are there state level issues? Are, they, are there any national or international issues that, that, that you guys come up against? So the, the regulatory process uh, right now is, um, you know, for us, it's it's a little bit of a little bit of a patchwork, um, state, local, federal, all of those levels. Uh, you know, Fish and Wildlife EPA, NOAA, um, the Army Corps. Uh, you know, there's sort of a sort of a, a mix of different agencies in the mix. And when we present this, um, you know, we 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 ultimately present it to an interagency regulatory meeting. Um, at which you know all the agencies can actually get together and say you know yes we understand how this is happening we understand how it's being monitored and therefore we support it um, but yeah that's the framework that we're that we're operating in at the moment so it's primarily a question of getting permit approval it's not like there need to be new laws enacted for you to deploy or laws that's, to be changed that's right yeah there's there's no laws that would prevent this that's great, from, from cool. Yeah, it's. Um, it's I'm, I could ask questions all day, but I'm going to stop because we literally have dozens of questions in the audience chat. Um, Mega, do you want to um, hop on and kind of start hey. asking some of this? Great, thank you. Sure. Yeah, we do have a bunch of questions. Um, just a quick one to start. Uh, you guys talk about coastal carbon capture, and I've seen the term coastal enhanced weathering elsewhere. Um, is there a difference, and why do you guys use the term that you use? Yeah, so coastal enhanced weathering is is what has uh, is the term that's appeared in the scientific literature for about the last you know, 20, 25 years. Um, you know, we, we coined the term coastal carbon capture um, to to really talk about the practical application of the science of coastal enhanced weathering. And so really to distinguish between uh, between the academic study and the uh, and, and the practical ideas of actually making this happen. Um, as a side note, as we as we used to talk to people about coastal enhanced weathering, we, we sort of found that people's eyes would glaze over because the term didn't make a lot of sense to people. And so we also tried to just come up with something that encapsulates encapsulates this technique in a way that's a little bit more understandable. Yep, totally makes sense. Um, we got a bunch of questions about siting and basically what's the ideal location. So could you just talk a little bit about, you know, what makes the ideal site for this kind of things? I think some of the considerations people brought up were, um, you know, level of erosion, the type of site you're in, but also distance from the olivine uh, source, um, things like that. How do you actually kind of balance all those different considerations? Yeah, it's a really great question. And uh, as you probably would, as I'm, sure, I'm sure everyone would imagine something that we've spent quite a lot of time uh, working on. Um, you know, there's there's a number of there's a number of different uh, there's a number of different factors. I'll, I'll highlight a few. Um, so one of them one of them is the overall efficiency of the process, as as you mentioned. Right? We don't want to be shipping olivine ten thousand right. miles around the world. Um, yeah. The good news is that there are actually olivine sources in quite a few different places around the world. Um, so yeah, we're, we're always we're always looking at what is what they call the embodied emissions or the process emissions involved with actually doing this. So uh, we emit some carbon dioxide to get the olivine into, in, into the site and then it starts to remove CO2. So we want to make sure we're accounting for that in the process. Uh, our target is to remove uh, 20 times the amount of carbon dioxide that we emit in the process. Um, so there's, there's first is sort of a logistical element. 
Uh, the second I would say is um, there is different sort of scientific and oceanographic factors. So things like the temperature of the water, because it's more efficient at warmer, at warmer temperatures, probably not going to be going to the Arctic Circle for this. Okay. Um, the age of the water, the amount of wave action that's present, all of these things uh, affect how, um, how it's going to work. And then I would say that the, the third thing, uh, and very much in line with what we've been talking about, um, when, there, when there's an existing coastal nourishment project that's already planned, that makes things uh, go a lot more smoothly, right? Because okay. this is already, there's already something that's happening. We already need to protect the coastline. And so we can protect the coastline in a carbon removing way by including all of the sand in those projects. And that's not to say that we'll only do it in that setting, but that is a way um, that is a way where we can um, really contribute to coastal resilience, uh, which is very important to us. Got it. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, you know, once you're starting to scale up, how, is it kind of one big dump of olivine or how often do you have to think about replenishing the olivine to keep the reaction moving efficiently? The, 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 um, when we do a deployment, uh, it will gradually remove CO2 from the atmosphere over the course of a few decades. And that's actually an important uh, feature of this, which is we don't want to uh, we don't want to pull on the strings to uh, to uh, we don't want to jerk on the strings too um, aggressively, right? We want to make sure that any intervention we uh, we're doing in natural systems is not happening too rapidly, but is in fact a a gradual process. So right. it 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 uh, will dissolve over a few decades. And and sometimes people ask us, you know, well, hang on a minute. We Um, all right. And is that, I guess, when you think about MRV, I know you talked about it quite a bit with Toby, um, but is the time aspect of it something you kind of bake into your MRV calculations or um, is it sort of an absolute term? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the dissolution time is, is certainly something that we'll be, we'll be monitoring in all, in all deployments that we do so we can be transparent about exactly when the carbon dioxide is, is being captured. It's very much a part of it. And when we measure uh, what's called the alkalinity flux. So basically mm -hmm. the change in alkalinity uh, in, in the, uh, that's caused by the olivine sand, that gives us not only the amount of carbon removal, it also gives us the rate. And so that's something that we'll be right. doing as well. Yeah, a couple of people actually asked about the alkalinity question. So, you know, to the extent there's that co-benefit of reducing ocean acidification, helping, you know, local ecosystems, um, how much of that impact actually stays localized to the area to where it can benefit, you know, a coral reef or that ecosystem versus what gets dispersed to the wider ocean? So eventually, it will all get dispersed to the to the wider ocean. But the um, but in the the near term effect, you know, as as the olivine dissolves, uh, the alkalinity is created locally and will have will have a modest. Uh, effect on the uh, on the um, pH of the local ecosystem, and so that that there'll, there'll sort of be this this constant mild decrease in ocean acidification in any coastal area where we do this, which will eventually, after several decades, wash out into the broader ocean. And we're uh, looking into a few studies right now to study exactly that, like wh what does introducing olivine to a coral reef uh, do to increasing local alkalinity? How does it affect it um, to corals and both the seagrasses? And we have a series of ecotoxicology experiments that are underway to understand the ecological effects on, on other kinds of organisms, but specifically as it relates to corals and seagrasses uh, with this alkalinity change, we're really curious about that to identify whether there are any, any, any um, you know, visible co-benefits. Yeah, makes sense. And are there any, um, I mean, one of the questions was just around kind of uh, potential side effects or knock-on effects. Are there any that you're particularly, you know, looking into or concerned about? Um, this person mentioned potentially, you know, the swing in bicarbonate, bicarbonate concentrations um, or the availability of olivine for normal geological CO2 capture cycles uh, that it's already part of. Yeah, well, um, to take the second part of that, um, the, the olivine for normal natural CO2 capture, 
that that is an extremely slow process so that happens over the course of many tens of thousands of years and it only happens at the surface so if we remove olivine from underneath the surface uh, of, of the ground then we're not taking away from any of the any of the mm -hmm. natural removal um, you know in in terms of in terms of impacts on the ocean environment um, we uh, this is something that we plan to monitor very closely so you know we will be changing the ocean's geochemistry a little bit uh, and you know we'll be doing that in a way to bring it back more toward where we started before the industrial revolution nonetheless it's very important that we monitor everything very closely and so we'll be doing that uh, monitoring the chemistry of the ocean monitoring the ecology of the ocean where we do this so we can completely understand any uh, any effects that happen uh, whether positive or negative yeah, makes sense. Um, another question, I guess, on a similar vein was um, a couple of people asked about the potential contamination from nickel and chromium, which I guess are found in other volcanic rocks as well. Uh, is that something you've looked at? Absolutely. Yeah. So the um, olivine does contain, and, um, you know, at, at high concentrations, those can be toxic. Um, so that's something we are, uh, you know, in relation to what I was saying before, going to be monitoring very closely. And also, as Kelly mentioned, we are running in a very extensive series of um, aquarium experiments on key indicator species to understand, uh, you know, what the effects of those um, of those metals could be on on those species. Um, the, you know, the, the the thing that gives us a reasonable degree of of comfort around around this is the slow dissolution you know we're not going to be suddenly introducing a large amount of you know of nickel into the ocean um you know and frankly there's more nickel in the spoon you just ate your breakfast with than you know we're, we're going to be introducing on any meaningful time scale <laughs> right yeah, yeah. I just add to that is the the current availability of olivine in natural systems so for example there's Papakalea Beach, which is a naturally occurring olivine sand beach on the Big Island of Hawaii, and yep. uh, we just we've just begun a, a process of trying to understand that as an analog um, for for what we're trying to do, a natural analog. And uh, you know, just speaking to the abundance of olivine, which Tom just mentioned, most of it's under under the surface. It is one of the most abundant minerals on on Earth, right? It makes up over fifty percent of the upper mantle, um, and so kind of. As we as we spoke to earlier, you know what we're trying to do is is to safely accelerate this this a part of this natural process. And uh, luckily, there's a lot of precedent around planet Earth uh, for olivine doing this doing this thing on its own for for many many years. Yeah, and you yeah. mentioned Papakalea, which is a natural olivine beach in you know in Hawaii. I've, I've been there. I've snorkeled in the water, and uh, it's a thriving ecosystem. You can actually see corals growing on the olivine there. So, um, you know that's. That's that's an encouraging data point. Yeah, and also just be before we jump off this one, we just recently learned that Staten Island is mostly made of serpentinite, um, mm -hmm. which is a mineral that's incredibly similar to olivine. Um, and so, just again speaking to the the abundance of it, I think is is uh, fascinating. All the thing the the solutions that are literally under our feet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, actually, we had a question. Well, I guess that speaks to your point about the abundance of it. Um, if we're thinking about like gigaton scale uh, carbon capture, um, is there a limiting factor on this? Like, is you know, is it is there enough olivine to do that? Is there a limit on how much coastline is available? Kind of what's the scale potential of this? Yeah, I mean, this this scales to, uh, you know, if everything, if everything works well, this scales into the billions of tons uh, per year, which is very unusual when you look at different climate solutions. Um, availability of olivine um, is probably one of one of the least constraining things. Okay. Uh, estimates, estimates vary, but there's at least a trillion tons out there. So a thousand billion tons. Um, <clears throat> Availability of coastlines, you know, we, we need, we look at the, the shelf seas as the relevant areas here. So as opposed to the deep ocean, uh, the shelf seas represent about 8% of the ocean area. And, you know, we'd need less than a quarter of a percent of shelf seas to do a billion tons. So, you know, we can't use all shelf seas, not, not all shelf seas are, are ideal deployment sites, but, mm. you know, th there's a lot of area before we start to run into, before we start to run into constraints there. Okay, cool. Yeah, talking about scaling up, um, we had a question uh, acknowledging this might be early to be asking this. Um, are you thinking about moving olivine to a central place to grind it? Do you grind locally at like the sites where you're uh, planning to distribute it, or is that you know too far ahead in the future? Yeah, typically uh, the, the we, we've of course thought about sort of the supply chain. How do you get the olivine 
out of the ground and ground up and to, to the right places and that there are different ways we could innovate around that in the future but um at a at a high level uh, generally the idea is to grind it on site and then move it to the deployment sites uh, typically mines already have grinders um, mm -hmm. sites so that's probably the most efficient way efficient way to do it yeah makes sense and what else do you see as your biggest challenges to scaling up as you're thinking about the future that's a really good question. Um, I think I think the challenges to the challenges to scaling are. I mean, so the one is. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the, the regulatory landscape, right? I mean, we just we'd love to see uh, we'd love to see, you know, top level um, economic support for CDR as distinct uh, for permanent CDR, you know, as distinct from reduced emissions, as distinct from uh, temporary CDR, you know, as a society, we need to find a way to put a price on CDR that's official. Right now we're relying on the voluntary carbon market uh, mostly, and that is growing very rapidly. You know, it, it seems seems to have roughly trebled in the last year, which is which is incredible. Uh, and at the same time, that's, uh, that's only a small fraction of what actually needs to get done. So kind of top level national and, and even international, of course we have COP26 coming up, um, you know, yeah. top level support, you know, with with real dollars behind it for and real commitments for for CDR, I think it's probably the biggest thing that would prevent us from uh, that would enable us to get to you know multiple billions of tons of scale. Um, we're also just early in the process. There's a lot of science to do. You know, we're not we're not trying to take any shortcuts here. You know, it's incredibly important to us to do this in a fully scientifically robust and ethical manner, and um, that's just that's going to take time. You know that's going to take um, you know uh, many years to to really prove out all the science and to uh, gradually scale up uh, in a way that's responsible. Cool. Um, I'm going to finish with one last question. Um, this is from someone in India who says they're working on carbon capture technology um, and they're in a south coastal area. So, how would someone like that um, implement the solution? You know, help Project Vesta learn more about it, um, help the environment in that area. They're interested in kind of a real life demo of this. And I would open that up obviously beyond India. How would anyone who's excited about this uh, get more involved? Yeah, awesome. My favorite question so far. Um, so um, yeah, please, yeah, please reach out to us, Tom at projectvesta.org or Kelly at projectvesta.org. Um, we would absolutely love to uh, we'd absolutely love to collaborate. You know, we're looking for sites and we're actually working on a site uh, in India at the moment, in a different part of India. So um, you know, if if people you know live near coastlines and are looking at CDR solutions, and you know would like to would like to explore the idea of of us collaborating to um, to do a to do a demonstration pilot in your area, southern part of India would be a fantastic location. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Cool. Thanks so much, guys. This was super interesting. Um, I'm really excited to like go look at this Hawaiian olivine beach at some point. Um, thank, thanks so much. I'm going to hand over quickly to Toby to just wrap things up. Um, but thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank really you. Absolutely. It. Thank you, Tom and Kelly. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, it was really fascinating. And thank you to the audience for so many questions. It was, they were really specific and great. Um, so thank you again. We really appreciate it. Um, and we put links to the, your emails and to your uh, Twitters and website in the chat. So everyone who's interested, please uh, connect with Project Vesta. Um, there are also links in the chat to what we have upcoming on uh, This is CDR. Um, more Ocean next week with uh, Marty Odlin from Running Tide. Uh, Charm Industrial um, Bio Oil on November 9th. November 16th, we're back to the ocean again for Planetary Hydrogen taking a uh, U.S. Thanksgiving week off. Then we have Noya on November 30th, um, direct air capture uh, from uh, cooling towers, which is very interesting and innovative, uh, particularly for urban audiences like us in New York City. And then uh, Sea Change, another electrochemical ocean CDR process out of uh, UCLA that was one of the most recent uh, strike purchases is on December 7th. So, um, Thank you again for joining us. Uh, there should be links to our Twitter, our website, the sign up form on our website and the chat, um, LinkedIn, Instagram. So please uh, stay in touch with us. And if you're interested, please 
um, join our community. There's uh, lots of projects and new projects get spun up every week, basically, including probably one today about Serpentine in Staten Island. So um, thank you again. We really appreciate you being with us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.